guidance and support of Ambassador Verma today, who, who is present with the entire uh, senior brass for uh, just steering the entire discussions today and what exactly needs to be done. So thank you so much, uh, sir, uh, for joining us today. We have Mr. Mani Singhal, the Deputy Secretary General and Head of PT International, uh, would request uh, that uh, Mr. Singhal to present his welcome remarks and then we uh, you know, move ahead with the program. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Rohit, for starting this off. Uh, good evening, everyone in India. Good afternoon in Russia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the onset, I think we all must pay our gratitude and stand by the solidarity with all the frontline coronavirus warriors for their sacrifice and their efforts in fighting COVID. And this is both in India and Russia and around the world. On behalf of FIKI, uh, I have the privilege of welcoming Ambassador Venkatesh Varma. He's always been a great support to FIKI and support to the cause of India and Russia and economic engagement. Uh, Mr. Leonid, uh, Leonid Petukov, CEO of the Far East Investment Agency. Uh, Mr. Manish Prabhat, Joint Secretary, Eurasia Division. I think he should be joining us any moment, if not already there. Then uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar, uh, our DCM in Moscow, and our CG uh, Vladivostok, Mr. Bhushan, uh, welcome. Uh, in addition, we have the uh, pleasure of presence uh, of Mr. Shiv Kemka, the Vice Chairman of Sun Group, who's a, who's a Russian expert from the business point of view in his own right. Uh, I am still not very clear whether he's an Indian or a Russian, but he's probably the best mix of both. Uh, Ms. Ritu Agarwal, Country Head Russia uh, at the National Skill Development Corporation. And of course, we have representatives of our partners in Russia and India from Ross Congress and Business Russia and the trade representation of Russia and India. Today, this interaction, like Rohit said, has been built upon a, a major initiative which took place in the Russian Far East last year uh, uh, at the behest of Prime Minister Modi who was the chief guest at uh, the fifth Eastern Economic Forum uh, at the request of uh, His Excellency Vladimir Putin, the President of Russian Federation. Uh, this uh, event in se September was represented not only by the who's who of our government, of course, under leadership of uh, Ambassador Varma, uh, it was also supported by a 60 member, very high powered business delegation and we signed over 50 MOUs in the presence of the two premiers that time. So this was, of course, a follow-up, I would say, of the visit, uh, 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 which was of a 150-member strong business delegation. This was in August, and our very own uh, Commerce and Industry Minister, Mr. Piyush Goel, had led a delegation uh, of this uh, business community from India to explore the Russian Far East. He was also accompanied by chief ministers of Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat, Haryana, and Goa uh, to, to look at newer opportunities which are so, so far not explored by Indian companies overseas. And this included things like uh, mining, diamond processing, rare earth metals, agriculture, fisheries, food processing, of course, oil and gas, forestry, timber, coal, power, ceramics, I mean, and uh, any, any mineral and natural resource you can think of would be there. And obviously the region being fairly virgin uh, opens opportunity for a lot of manufacturing uh, to supply not only to Russian Federation, but also to the rest of the world from there. Uh, the visits were planned as part of government sustained focus efforts on the Russian Far East uh, because the Russian Far East uh, 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 offers us something which nobody else offers. Before I come to that, let me also mention that uh, when we talk of Russia or Russian Far East, we are talking of a country which is uh, ranking 28th in ease of doing business uh, as of 2019, and I think it was similar in 2020. Uh, the Far East region by itself attracts one third of total Russian foreign direct investment now. So that speaks for itself. And coming back, uh, this is the backdrop of the fact that you know our trade currently is just about 8.23 billion dollars uh, and uh, this trade is much below the potential and that's why both our leaders 
have looked at a target of $30 billion. Now this $30 billion by 2025 can happen through the Russian Far East. Why Russian Far East at all? Just if I can put it in a quick summary, and I'm sure Ambassador, Mr. Shiv Khemka and everybody will elaborate more. You know, this is a labor scarce region, resource rich region, and it needs capital technology plus the markets out of there because the Russian Far East by itself is not a populist market. At the same time, while it has abundant of resources, and when I say resources is both the mineral and uh, natural resources, it has abundance of farmland also, so which could help India for its uh, food security. So keeping these two, three things in mind, uh, uh, this was the long-term vision of government of India to look at the Russian Far East and prime minister led from the front uh, to uh, take this initiative. Uh, before I conclude and request ambassador to share his perspective, uh, let me also mention that Russian Far East is really not that far. Uh, just as a comparison, the flight from Moscow itself is about nine hours. And uh, with the government having announced a direct shipping route between Vladivostok and Chennai, I think it will go a long way in boosting this trade. And uh, we would like to hear our uh, industry representatives uh, to share a little bit more perspective on the business opportunities there. Uh, with these words, uh, I would request Ambassador Venkatesh Verma to kindly share his perspective on the Russian Far East and the opportunity uh, of economic engagement which it throws up, especially post-COVID-19, where India's priorities would also uh, undergo a change like any other country in the world. Uh, a seasoned diplomat, Ambassador Verma studied Russian. He's had two stints earlier in Russia in 1990 and 92 and then followed by another one in 2000 to 2003. He, his diplomatic career, he's also served as director in the Prime Minister's office and Joint Secretary Disarmament and MEA. And prior to his posting in uh, Madrid, he was also the ambassador and permanent representative of India to the Conference on Disarmament. He's been the first recipient of the S. Kissing Award for Excellence in Indian Foreign Service. Congratulations, a belated congratulations for that ambassador. Uh, this was in 2010, and of course, his contribution to the negotiation of civil nuclear deal is probably known to all of us. I request Ambassador to please address us. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon to everyone, and <clears throat> warm greetings to all of you who have joined us uh, today from Moscow, from the Indian Embassy. Thank you very much, uh, Manish, uh, Mr. Manish Singhal, uh, Fiki, and I want to take this opportunity for our very deep appreciation for the unwavering solid support <clears throat> that FIKI has extended to India-Russia relations generally, but also to the extraordinary diplomatic effort that has undertaken last year. Firstly, by His Excellency, the, our Commerce Minister, uh, Mr. Piyush Goyal, who led uh, 150 member strong business delegation uh, including four chief ministers to Vladivostok and followed by the path-breaking visit of our prime minister uh, <clears throat> to Vladivostok in September, both as the chief guest at the Eastern Economic Forum and also for the bilateral summit. And that, uh, those two visits and the prime minister's visit in particular laid the basis for a fundamental transformation of how India looks at the Far East. A very ambitious roadmap was laid out and uh, Manish, I want to thank you for, uh, for touching on the main points of the, uh, of the roadmap. Uh, I would like to focus my comments today on uh, one of the main concerns that may be weighing on everybody's mind, uh, all those who have joined us today, <clears throat> on what would happen uh, because of the COVID pandemic to the roadmap of cooperation that we had, uh, that we had set out. Uh, many of you will recall, and Manish, you too would recall that uh, uh, in March, we were looking forward to the visit of a very major delegation of uh, Russian governors of the Far East to, to India. Uh, everything was tied up. Uh, they were to call on the Prime Minister. Our Honorable uh, Minister of uh, Commerce and Industry was, was hosting them. Our External Affairs Minister was to have met them. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we've had to postpone that. 
uh, our prime minister himself was to have come to Moscow in May uh, and also visit St. Petersburg in the, uh, for the BRICS and SEO summit. Well, all these have been put off. But uh, I want to express uh, my confidence that this roadmap that we have set out has only been temporarily de delayed. It has not been derailed. In fact, uh, we should move forward with renewed uh, confidence uh, and determination uh, because in difficulties, uh, friends look at uh, ways of expressing solidarity. Uh, friends look at expressing faith in each other. And I'm sure that is not in short supply as far as India-Russia relations are concerned. Uh, these are difficulties that neither India nor Russia created, but we have been the subject of all the fallback uh, or the fallout that has happened because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, if there are challenges, we should look for opportunities in those challenges, uh, and there are many, and we can discuss them. I'll list out a few. We look forward to the, the comments of our uh, good friend and our, uh, our great support, uh, Mr. Petukov, who has joined us, and I'd like to thank him and his team for um, for extending support uh, uh, consistently uh, over the past year. We also have from the Russian side, Ross Congress, uh, Ross Gialgio, Ross Atom, the trade representative from India, uh, Spare Bank uh, representatives are there. Um, of course, as we speak, uh, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and the uh, Eurasia Division headed by uh, Manish Prabhat has always been a very solid pillar of support for our efforts. We have the NSDC, uh, we have the Pack, and several others, and the two friends of India, and two friends of India-Russia relations who have joined us today. So out of challenges, we look for opportunities. And out of opportunities, I think we should look for specific projects. Now, let me say a few words about the impact, the economic impact that the COVID pandemic has had on Russia and uh, give a little bit of a comparison with respect, to, uh, uh, with respect to India. Of course, India and Russia, the scales are different, but I think the approaches are pretty similar. And the approaches are that the, both governments have kept a very sharp eye on the reducing the economic impact and improving the prospects of economic revival as soon as the, as soon as the pandemic is over. I think there are, these are two parallels. We see that in the in the Russian case. We see that in the in the Indian case, uh, uh, and I think uh, this is an extremely good sign. Secondly, we have seen certain sectors that have uh, become far more prominent because of the pandemic, and whose prominence will continue in the post-pandemic uh, period as well. Of course, pharma and the health sector is the most obvious one. Uh, uh, this is uh, more in terms of public awareness, uh, the importance that the governments will attach to the pharma and the health se uh, sector as we move along. And pharma and the health se healthcare sectors have always been prominent in the India-Russia uh, context. And these, I think, we should incorporate into the India-Russia engagement on the Russian Far East. Digital is the second one. Uh, we've seen uh, it's been a trend that has been growing, but uh, the application of digital technologies to enhance uh, the response to the COVID pandemic uh, in various forms, uh, as we speak today and as we speak now, um, uh, and a conference of this would have been uh, very seldomly held in the, in the pre-pandemic uh, 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 period, but now it's almost a daily occurrence. So uh, this is just a small example of how we go forward. Agro, fertilizers and chemicals, these are again uh, not new sectors, but I think countries are realizing that they need more dependable, more credible, less uh, vulnerable to um, disruption, and most importantly for Russia, and I think for India, to avoid over-dependence. And uh, that is a lesson that uh, we have all learned, and I think this is a lesson that we can very profitably use. Uh, migration and the in the larger sphere and uh, and labor, uh, the availability of labor, the availability of skilled labor, the the uh, the, uh, the relocation of labor. I would not say the dislocation, but the relocation of labor. And I think this is a conversation that we we began very well last year, 
but assumes greater importance, even greater importance now. And I think the, the conversations that we started uh, and some good progress, uh, we also hear there have been uh, a few thousand Indian workers already in the Far East, not just in the diamond sector, we're also looking for it in the um, in, in the infrastructure sector, but obviously we also want to take it into the agro sector. Now, quite honestly, uh, quite frankly, there were two sectors that we were looking at, which look substantially difficult in the short term. One, one is in the diamond uh, sector, where we, we have had good cooperation in the past. We were all poised to expand it in a very big manner. Uh, the present difficulties are not specific to India and Russia. They are more global, but I think we should keep the interest alive and, uh, and going and pick up the diamond sector expansion, uh, say, in a, uh, in a few months' time. Similarly, in timber, we had made some headway. Uh, we were looking at uh, sourcing timber from the Russian Far East into India. Uh, there has been some delay in this. Uh, here, too, I think the, uh, the issues are quite substantial, but I think we'll work through them as we go forward. The, we are already seeing some green shoots of growth in the Russian Far East. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, numbers which say that agricultural production, especially with respect to uh, fruits and vegetables, has shot up because this is a result of the disruption of supply chains from China. So when you move from an old system to a new system, actually, you will see opportunities which were not visible in the past. And I would very much encourage all our colleagues who have joined us today to look at the Russian Far East and uh, how we can incorporate that into India-Russia cooperation uh, with new eyes, with new perspective, and of course, with new confidence. Uh, let me also say a few words about uh, port infrastructure, energy. Uh, we are making considerable headway with respect to cooking coal. Uh, cooking coal has a, a, a very good link with uh, the future of the steel industry in India. I would request uh, all of you to uh, to pay uh, focused attention on this because um, this is one of the sectors that has not been affected. In fact, our opportunities uh, will be much more. Uh, related to that is, of course, port infrastructure and, and other forms of infrastructure that are there. Uh, we, uh, we are looking at opportunities. The opportunities will not go away. We'll have to see them in new, new light. Uh, if there is uh, a temporary economic uh, dislocation and, and depression, some of these assets may in fact be a little more attractive than in the past. So uh, I think keeping an open mind is something that we, um, the, that we need to do. Uh, connectivity, we're looking at the Eastern uh, Board Maritime Corridor. We've already ha had a first uh, uh, interaction at the governmental level, but this is something, something that can also be promoted uh, at the at the private sector level. Now, having said this, let me say that the embassy will remain committed 24/7 to interacting with Fiki. We're interacting with our uh, with our Russian partners here, uh, with the Russian ministry, uh, with the Russian government, with the Far East Agency, uh, with the uh, with the local governments uh, in in the Russian Far East, and I like to recognize the presence of our Council General Shashi, who's just joined in and. Uh, he is very enthusiastic to go forward with our cooperation. But most importantly, the embassy, uh, uh, my deputy chief of mission, Mr. Brene Pradhan is here. Our entire economic team is here, headed by, uh, by Asim. Uh, you know that they are available to you 24-7. Uh, uh, if we can increase the number of hours in a day, we will uh, take that into account as well. So there is no difficulty as far as the embassy is concerned. Uh, we are with you. Uh, we are prepared as a, as a result of this conversation today. We are prepared in consultation with FIKI to organize sectoral, specific sectoral B2B interactions so that uh, uh, of, uh, on issues of interest to each sector, uh, uh, we can pursue it. As far as the government is concerned, uh, uh, India is committed to what was agreed during Prime Minister's visit uh, a, uh, to Vladivostok in, in September. Uh, most importantly, we are looking at a $1 billion uh, 
soft credit line. Uh, there have already been some interactions between our finance ministry, our, our external affairs ministry, and uh, the Russian uh, finance ministry. It's a, it's a work in progress. Nobody has lost sight of it. We are working on it. Uh, there are uh, uh, several suggestions on how we can make it more effective, more productive. Uh, we are open to suggestions from the business community because finally it is uh, um, uh, our colleagues in the business community that will have to make uh, use of it. Uh, uh, and this is something that we will go through, uh, go forward in a, in, in, in a manner of consultation. Uh, lastly, let me uh, conclude by saying that uh, uh, President Putin is expected to visit uh, uh, India on a bilateral visit. Uh, sometime in October, uh, that that is uh, that has been considered. Uh, we don't have uh, specific dates as yet. Uh, dates have not been announced. Uh, our Prime Minister, who was to have visited uh, Russia in May, uh, would be visiting Russia at some stage in the uh, do, uh, during the next few months when uh, the military parade for the 75th anniversary uh, for. Uh, the Victory Day will be celebrated, and of course, there is also the uh, the pending uh, BRICS and SEO summit. So we look forward to two big interactions that we already know: uh, Prime Minister's visit to uh, Russia and President Putin's visit to India. So uh, there is no dearth of opportunities, no dearth of high-level attention, um, the, and I think something that uh, we can all benefit. Uh, uh, from that. Uh, let me, of, of course, uh, wish all of you good health, uh, uh, safe business uh, as we move along. Uh, I would like to join Manish in, uh, in covering on behalf of the embassy uh, or to both on the Indian side and on the Russian side, uh, all the professionals in the, in the health sector, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the, the attendants, uh, the ambulance drivers, uh, the researchers, the scientists, uh, those who are out in the field doing work, uh, collecting uh, 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 samples for vaccines, for drug production. I must say compliment also our pharma industry. They have bought such good name for India abroad, including in Russia. Of course, they already, always had a good name in Russia, but after uh, our ability to supply to the world and to all our friends abroad, uh, the hydro hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol and, and other uh, medical equipment. And I think our stock has only gone up. Uh, our, uh, our deep appreciation to our fantastic uh, pharma industry. Uh, we are here to help you. Um, I think uh, uh, despite the difficulties, as I said, uh, in, in difficulties, friends look for faith and solidarity. Uh, we look for opportunities and challenges and out of opportunities, we would look for specific projects. So thank you very much for joining us and we are available uh, to help you all, all along. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I think you, you've only been central to the India-Russia relationship and your talk probably helps to bridge some more uh, you know, uh, areas of cooperation between Russian Far East and India. We have taken note of your idea of, you know, probably following this up with sectoral B2Bs. And uh, I assure you that we will work this out with your team. Uh, this is definitely a good idea. And, you know, uh, the current situation should not uh, hold us back from business. Uh, only that, you know, when you talked about meeting in a voice, uh, in a video conference, it reminded me that we also had two video conferences in the run-up to Prime Minister's visit. But that time, we never thought that this would be a new normal. Uh, anyway, true. without much ado, uh, I would now request uh, Mr. Petuko, the CEO of the Far East Investment and Export Agency, to deliver his keynote address. And he would actually be the key person for the Indian industry to, uh, to assist and facilitate in investments. I can only share, as, a, as, as my knowledge from the visits to Russian Far East that the Far East Development uh, Agency is actually a very, very professional and proactive organization. And uh, really, if I can put it that way, uh, you do not get to feel the Russian bureaucracy when you deal with them. Uh, previous to his current position, Mr. Petukov was General Director of ANO Far East Investment Agency. 
uh, 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 since 2017. And prior to that, he's held various management positions in Russia and overseas, uh, which includes his stint with McKinsey from 2000 to 2008. So you can understand that we've got the best man at the helm, and uh, he probably uh, would be very, very proactive to help investments into the Russian Far East. Please welcome Mr. Petoko. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, good, 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 good evening, uh, our colleagues in uh, India, and uh, good day, our friends from Moscow. Uh, definitely, Your Excellency, Mr. Varma, and uh, my friend, Mr. Manish, thank you very much for uh, spending your time. Um, before, because we have so many people now joining uh, the call, let me uh, go back a little bit and talk about uh, what is the Russian Far East, uh, who we are, and what are the projects we are talking about. And then afterwards, I will uh, address exactly um, uh, the challenges, uh, but also, as Mr. Varma said, the opportunities I think we have in front of us because all this uh, COVID uh, crisis. So uh, we'll uh, circulate the presentation uh, afterwards. And if somebody from my colleagues who is on the line can put the presentation on the screen, I would appreciate that. While they're doing that, um, just uh, quick facts. Uh, Russian Far East, it's basically 11 regions of uh, Russia. It's approximately half of Russian territory. And um, as it was said, uh, just 9.3 million of people living there uh, with uh, significant natural, natural resources. We have 80% uh, of uh, Russian diamonds sitting, uh, the resources sitting in the Russian Far East in Yakutia. 57% of gas resources, uh, around half of uh, Russian forest resources, and around 40% of um, uh, fresh water, and around one third of gold. Uh, myself, uh, as a part of the Russian government system, uh, I, so the closest equivalent from the Indian side would be, I think, uh, Mr. Bagla from Invest India. Uh, my job is, as well, is to promote investments in Russian Far East and also export from Russian Far East. Uh, we technically are part of the, the Ministry for the Development of Far East, uh, and our boss is Mr. Trutnev, uh, unfortunately, who was unable to come to India uh, two months ago. Uh, in terms of what we do, uh, our job is basically promote. Uh, our job is uh, to integrate, because we have a lot of very reputable partners on the line with from Sberbank, from Russian Export Center, from very many other authorities from Russian side. So we are happy to introduce you to those guys whose job is also to financially support you. We don't have uh, physically money to give you export and import loans, but we can get you in touch with the agencies who has these uh, resources, for example. Uh, I think so far, Far East is doing good. Uh, for the five years, uh, as of now, we have uh, uh, regional GDP growing faster than the rest of uh, Russia. And I would say the fixed assets investments is growing around 10%, which is higher than China. Uh, it's uh, the number since uh, 2017, so for the last three years. So we're doing good. I think what is important, and uh, the colleagues whom we are already working with for a while from India, they're aware, uh, for the Russian Far East, there is a, a special economic regime uh, called free economic zones, which means that uh, first, uh, there is uh, very little taxes for the projects in the Far East, Far East, meaning new projects. For example, zero profit tax, uh, social tax, which is basically the tax you pay on the pay payroll, is only 7% instead of 30 for the rest of Russia. Uh, we also have uh, basically one shop, uh, one window shop approach, meaning that you come and then basically other agencies uh, like us or the ministry is basically helping you to get all the licenses and state permits. But most important, I think that uh, the state provides uh, free infrastructure, uh, meaning roads, electricity. Uh, in some cases, uh, this is just direct subsidy to the, to the business. The subsidy is typically limited to the uh, one tenth of the project costs. But if there are several projects and there is a big road which needs to be built to this uh, site, then it may be more uh, than uh, one tenth. Uh, investment from the state. And as, as, as I said, this is absolutely, you know, absolutely free uh, for, uh, for investors. Uh, the idea is that we uh, create this free economic zone as opposed to China, not uh, in the places where uh, 
they are like predetermined, but rather in the places where it is needed for investor. So meaning that every year we create four or five new free economic zones. The way it works, uh, the company comes, it lies for the new project, then uh, the ministry within one month or two months maximum uh, by the government decree sets uh, borders for the free economic zone. What it means, uh, not only uh, low taxes, but also all the equipment which will be brought there will be free from VAT and excise taxes. Uh, also, you'll have uh, much bigger allowances uh, for foreign workforce. In some cases, like in the KGK case, uh, we even for the first two years allowed 100% of the workforce were to be 100% uh, Indian, with some, of course, follow up with training of the Russian uh, employees. Also, fast track custom, uh, custom clearance and what's called e visa for foreign visitors. It's basically very similar to the e visa, which uh, work, works very well for somebody entering uh, India. They basically go to the internet site, apply, then in two days you get the printout, and then you, at the airport you go to the, uh, to the uh, passport control. So, as I said, we're doing good. Uh, in the pipeline, we have, before I go to the particular projects, uh, in the pipeline, we have uh, more than 2,000 projects. Uh, I think the most, obviously, because we have very few uh, people living, but a very huge natural resources. Uh, those projects are mostly uh, a resource expert, resource oriented or expert oriented, uh, which basically is agriculture. We have a total project for $2.1 billion timber. Uh, real estate and tourism. Uh, Far East is very uh, interesting place for um, very interesting place for uh, tourism and for eco-friendly tourism. I would call it this way. Uh, oil and gas refineries. Also mining and uh, logistics and uh, port infrastructure uh, as well. We, as of now, uh, we have around twenty-six projects with Indian uh, companies uh, if around more than two billion dollar with more than two billion dollar um, investments. Uh, I think we're doing, I'm happy to report to you, Your Excellency Ambassador, that we're doing good on the projects which we started like six months ago. Uh, KGK is doing good with the Agra project. Uh, again, Medant is doing good with the health projects in Buryatia and in a couple of uh, other regions. Uh, Tata Power, where despite the changes in their management, where they keep dialogue, they keep uh, exploration, the exploration program in Kamchatka for the coal. And uh, with uh, Coal India, with Indian guys, we're very good in, um, yeah, in coke and coal business uh, as well. I think um, the uh, COVID thing that basically uh, brought us a lot of opportunities as well. And I would say that some of them are very simple. Uh, first of all, you know that uh, Russian rubble uh, became weaker uh, as opposed to like dollar or, or euro or other uh, major currencies, which means that basically export became even more attractive for those who are doing uh, export oriented projects in Russia. So dollar wise, uh, I think, the, uh, so the net price for the Russian exporters of agriculture only increased as well as for the coal and uh, for metals and mining. So if you will think about this project as a basically that the dollar, uh, that your cost base is in uh, rubles, simply because you'll be paying uh, for the electricity, for taxes, everything will be paid in rubles. All these projects, the IRR became only more profitable and became only higher. Uh, also uh, in that regard, I think one of the areas uh, we, we are focusing on, and I'm seeing the chart here, that are guys from the steel industry. Um, we, uh, as promised, uh, I think there was a decision that uh, given that India consumes so much uh, coal it, and, and Russia produced so much coal, it will be very nice to sort of integrate uh, at some point these two uh, countries together. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big deals we're having, and I am proud to say that we concluded this deal, is basically big, uh, the biggest mine in the world called Mitchell Elga, former Mitchell's Elga field, which is the best quality coke and coal in, uh, in the world. Uh, it was acquired by Rostech, which is a state company with 25% share and also private investor related with Rostech uh, just uh, two weeks ago. And we are currently in the process of basically filing in all the specifications for the coke and coal 
for the uh, basically major steel companies in uh, uh, major steel companies in India. This will take, of course, some time, uh, but I think, and of course, as I told you earlier, uh, your help will be very much appreciated. But, uh, I think we're doing good because currently the problem there is that there's so many, uh, so many resources. Uh, the company has um, secured the port capacity for all the ships from 20,000 tons to 100,000 tons. Um, uh, the company is building, I would say, eight beneficiation plants. So in, uh, in three years, the maximum total capacity will be 30 million export coal per year, which is a lot. Currently, they're exporting around, I would say, uh, five, six million per year. Of coal and coal. I think this is exactly the project we can look at because with this uh, expansion of the plans, uh, 30 million of export will be around like 20% of worldwide export of the coal and coal. So it's really like big project. And in that sense, if we do it in, um, in the partnership with Indian companies, this may be a really interesting uh, project going forward. Because with this volume, we can um, even make uh, an index uh, trade, the pricing for the coal. As you know, Urals or, uh, or, or Siberian light in, in, uh, in oil and gas uh, industry. And for that, we need really good, reputable uh, consumers. And of course, India for the shareholders is the first uh, priority. Secondly, uh, I think everything which is uh, related to healthcare uh, is a very good uh, opportunity for us now. We have, for example, uh, I think around 20 new projects uh, which are arising now in the Russian Far East, uh, which relate to healthcare. Uh, in some cases, they're just uh, production of what we call uh, this uh, Tyvek, uh, costumes which protect uh, doctors from uh, viruses, which as uh, everybody in the world discovered now produced are produced only in China. And the prices for those, as everybody knows, came from like $10 six months ago to like to the, at the peak level, they were like $30. Uh, nobody likes that as well as uh, Russia. As you said, uh, Your Excellency, uh, too much dependence on uh, one country. So everything from these uh, cost suits uh, to like whatever, sanitary masks, all the stuff. We have several locations already predetermined. We have Russian investors and uh, we can either match Indian investors to Russian investors, or we have so much space there, the Indian, 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 Indian guys can come and set up a facility nearby. It's a relative, relatively low cost. It's uh, say, what I would say, the investments is from like one to five million US dollars but it's uh, very, uh, very profitable given how much, uh, how much uh, this whole thing will roll on and also how much strategic reserves of those uh, uh, equipment will be needed uh, for the future. Uh, in some cases, uh, we have the projects of, um, uh, of for example, tests, uh, you know, PCR tests, test, the test for COVID uh, testing. And here I have two types of projects. Uh, project number one, is basically when um, somebody from Russia, uh, the company called IFK Systema, it's a uh, uh, New York listed $3 billion company. They developed their own PCR test and they are ready to export it to India more like on a franchise basis. So if India needs it, we are ready, they're ready to come to send the equipment, to send the know-how and do the business in India. Obviously, because you have to take samples and then send it to laboratory, it's not possible to do it from Moscow. But like setting these facilities across India, I think is a very good idea and uh, uh, we welcome Indian partners to participate. Also, you know, there is another idea with the different kind of tests, what they call um, instant tests, which test for, for the anti, uh, antibodies in, in the blood. Uh, we have a very prominent Russian investor who has uh, partners in China and they basically bring this equipment to Shanghai uh, put it into the Russian Far East. And the idea is to export it then from Russian Far East. The business case here is that there are a lot of countries who do not start buying from China for political reasons. For example, US. And US is a big market for that. The prices for this uh, test there is like one or $200. The real cost of this test is like five to $10. So with that specific, uh, with that uh, part of the margin, it's a very, I think, lucrative business. Uh, and as I said, from Russian side, this is very uh, strong, reputable investor doing that. So we're also uh, Indian partners are welcome to join. 
both in terms of re-exporting, producing on the equipment in Russia, re-exporting to, to India, or re-exporting to other countries, or importing to Russia as well. Russia will consume a lot of those tests as well. Our price is here also very high. Uh, uh, we're doing tests now. I think the price for one test is instant tests and the commercial uh, black clinic is $100, again, with the cost of being 10. So uh, I think pharma, uh, and again, you're absolutely right. I think the whole crisis uh, shapes the mentality of people and the spending on pharma business, on vaccines, on uh, other things, it will be enormous and spendings will be enormous worldwide. So in that sense, I think um, uh, Russian Far East is the best location uh, for those, for antibiotics plants, for everything. And in many, many cases, pharma, uh, many people, when pharma, big pharma plant, for example, which will produce, uh, uh, again, antibiotics, because of the smell, because of other things, people don't like that to be relocated in the populated areas. Uh, so in uh, Russian Far East, we have four or five sites, which, uh, of course, uh, we comply with all environmental regulations, but still we have these locations uh, ready with infrastructure ready to go. So this would be number two. And number three for me uh, will be more like a question uh, to, to the audience. Uh, the idea is this, uh, we all read that after this uh, epidemic, uh, I think there will be some tectonic shifts in the distribution of basically production and investments across the world. And we're hearing that uh, our friend uh, Invest India are now finding the locations for the, those companies who want to withdraw some of the production facilities out from China to India. Uh, of course, I'm not suggesting that you, instead of India, bring them to the Russian Far East, but uh, I'm suggesting that uh, in very many of those, uh, there might be some specialization uh, or you start producing some raw material, some wood products or some uh, concentrate with iron ore in the Russian Far East, then bring it to India, then process it uh, finally completely and then send it to the third countries. So when, while you're doing this uh, global relocation thing, please keep in mind uh, that uh, Far East is here. And again, uh, I think we're uh, friends for very many countries. And uh, that's, that's why the flexibility is, uh, is, so, is so high. Uh, going forward, uh, I'm, I see that there are a lot of, I requested that my industry directors were grouped by industry, I mean the agency. I hear, we're also recording the, um, the chat uh, which also has a lot of requests for help from Indian, uh, from Indian uh, sites. So uh, then it depends on you, how do you want to go it in industry by industry now, or we have like a follow-up uh, calls like today, tomorrow, on Monday, Tuesday, or by, by industry, it's uh, your excellency uh, to decide basically. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petukov. Uh, uh, this is this is uh, a good good insight into the Russian Far East, and yes, yeah, surely I think pharma is, is a good area of cooperation. And we were it was nice to know that all, almost two billion dollars of investment is already there from India. And I think you rightly pointed out that cooking coal is a big opportunity. India is already importing a lot of it from other sources, so Russian Far East could be the place to look at. Uh, I would now uh, like to move on and request Mr. Shiv Kimpa, uh, Vice Chairman of Sun Global uh, Group, uh, to, to share his views and the way forward. His knowledge of both Russia and India, rather probably the globe, uh, is very intense. And I think we couldn't have managed a better way um, uh, to, to understand that. Mr. Kimpa is Vice Chairman of Sun Group. As I said, it's a diversified group. Uh, which, which deals in private equity, renewable energy, oil and gas, high technology, gold mining, and real estate. Uh, and his uh, empire, if I can call, spans from Latin America to West Africa, Middle East, Russia, of course, Ukraine, Central Asia, and uh, Myanmar, Japan, China. Uh, he himself currently is in US, uh, probably stuck there. So thanks, Shiv, for joining so early from the US. Uh, we request you to kindly share your perspective on the Russian Far East and what India can do. Shiv, please take over. Thank you. Manish, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, uh, I just really want to just say a couple of words because uh, I think we had a very comprehensive presentation from His Excellency the Ambassador and from Leonid 
uh, I see many friends on the uh, line who know Russia well. So I don't think I can add very much, but I just want to say a few words. The first is that we've been working in the, Rus in the Russian Far East now for the last 10 years or so um, uh, in Zabaikalsky Krai near Lake Baikal. We have a big gold mining project there, which is now fully funded and uh, being built, uh, getting operational in the next few years. Uh, for us, it's really been a pleasure to work in the Far East uh, of Russia. And not only is it a beautiful part of the world, but it's a place where, uh, you know, because of the very small population, I always tell people it's three times the size of India with a population half the size of uh, Mumbai. So it's a very small population, a huge uh, land mass. And, you know, I think any investments are welcome. Uh, the agency has done an incredible job under Leonid's, Mr. Petukhov's uh, incredible leadership to really welcome people there, to make it very professional, to organize everything in a way that everyone can understand, lay out strategically the options, and to hold people's hands as they enter the region. So I can only speak uh, very, very highly of the tremendous support from the Russian Far East uh, Investment Agency, uh, and obviously from our embassy in India, in, in Moscow. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity. Unfortunately, I think for all of us, this whole COVID situation has caused a dampener, at least for many of us uh, on the business. I know we are not in pharmaceuticals and some of those businesses that are directly uh, connected to uh, sort of servicing and uh, solving the COVID crisis on the planet. Um, but many sectors have been hit. I think many of us are looking at our investments very cautiously. But I would definitely put Russia, the Far East, in the top 20% uh, of destinations on the planet to look at uh, as an investor, uh, as someone that wants to uh, really continue to build their business during this downturn. And uh, I think the Far East Investment Agency is really someone that can guide you and hold your hand uh, to help you invest uh, and to do business with the Far East, uh, whether it's Far East with India or whether it's Indian companies investing in the Far East, I think uh, there could be no better Sherpa or guide uh, to uh, the, the work there. We uh, are continuing to look at more opportunities there. So the crisis has not dampened our enthusiasm in any way for the Far East. And uh, we, I'm confident in the next few years, we'll do more and more business in the Far East of Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv. Uh, this was short and a crisp, I would say, confidence-building talk uh, for you uh, because I'm seeing some comments on the chat box saying that, you know, uh, uh, companies would be dry on investments. Would it be the place to invest? So probably we'll look at some questions later on this. Uh, now, moving forward, uh, I would, I would uh, probably just look at some uh, questions, like I said, because these questions would give further insights to the participants. So if there are any questions, uh, may I request uh, uh, you know, people to maybe raise their hands and I'll try and spot, uh, spot them in the chat box. And maybe uh, Shiv, to start with you, if you could just explain some of these comments on the chat box where people are saying that uh, post-COVID companies would be strapped for cash. Maybe they might be very deft on investments. So, uh, but I, I would like to pick up strings from what Petukov said that companies are still looking at alternate investments uh, to de-risk themselves. So where does Russian Far East uh, come into the picture there? Uh, Rajkumar, can you unmute uh, Shiv? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a very real question. I think, uh, you know, there is a global recession. Uh, you know, a lot of liquidity has been taken out of the global economy. I think businesses everywhere on the planet are suffering due to this crisis. I mean, some, the digital sector and the pharma sector excluded, I think 
or the healthcare sector, you might say, where probably people are under stress and doing well, you know, well economically. I think um, it really is a question and challenge of how to prioritize one's investments and think about investing at this time. Uh, demand is down in many industries, including the steel industry as an example. So I think that it's going to take a little time. Uh, I don't think anyone, uh, except in areas like pharmaceuticals or very specific things, can look at the Far East uh, of Russia as a short-term investment opportunity. I really think it's a medium to long-term but extremely attractive investment opportunity. And it's in times like these when the bets you make uh, as a businessman looked, uh, looked at five or 10 years from now and people say, oh, that was a brilliant investment. So I would say that this is the time to really look hard because this is the time when you, know, you can uh, make uh, some great investments uh, globally. And I think the Russian Far East is one such opportunity which is really very high on our priority list to keep studying, looking at, and doing. So I do think it's a valid comment that when capital is scarce, you know, how can one really consider uh, investing in the Far East or anywhere in the world? I think, of course, very important here is support. Uh, the Russian government gives a lot of support to investment in the Far East. They have a whole a slew of support measures. Uh, and uh, I think that's fantastic. I know that the Indian government, you know, Prime Minister Modi uh, talked about, and I think it's under implementation, a billion dollar credit line to the Far East of Russia uh, for various types of investments and investors and opportunities. Uh, I'm sure that will be elucidated further. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be other benefits and kind of support mechanisms created to help uh, and encourage investment. Globally, that's happening, and there's no reason that won't happen in the Far East and, uh, uh, you know, to support Indian businesses as well. So I think there will be opportunities. I think uh, one needs to be mid to long term in one's view rather than short term. And I think one can find interesting opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. It has to be mid to long term and definitely the returns would be there uh, on the investments. Um, so, of course, uh, we have a lot of people. We have, we have a presentation from Wokhart Moscow and uh, from uh, uh, Bank India and Larson and Tubro. They all are interested. And like Petko already said, we have Tatas and other groups uh, already in uh, uh, Russian Far East. So uh, that itself speaks uh, of the opportunities there. Uh, so I think uh, with that, uh, I don't see any more hands raised for any questions. So uh, uh, if, uh, if Mr. Manish Prabhat is still around, because I think he was to leave early, uh, maybe request him for any comments. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think uh, we'll we'll uh, let it here. So I think uh, I'll also take the opportunity of uh, closing this session. Thank you once again, Ambassador, uh, DCM, Mr. Pradhan, CT Bloody Vostok, and of course uh, I think uh, everyone's friend uh, Asim you know, who's really uh, supported us to put this together along with Rohit and team. Uh, uh, this is a good starting point and Ambassador, uh, we will keep your advice in mind and work out some follow-up sessions to look at sectors which Petukov and Shiv have uh, shared. Uh, I think uh, it's a good idea to do this and especially if we have uh, some uh, uh, exchange of high-level visits later this year, it will be a good preparation for those also. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll have the next, uh, next Eastern Economic Forum virtually or physically. I think it's likely to be virtual or deferred, but uh, let's keep on uh, putting these efforts together. Uh, with those words, I would like to thank everyone for being with us today. And uh, my team is always there. Of course, we work very closely with Ross Congress, Business Russia, and the trade representation of Russia and India. So uh, any way we can facilitate your uh, Indian investments into Russian Far East. 
uh, or vice versa, we would be very happy to do so. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ambassador, once again.